Uh, this this episode is all about drugs. So, uh, <laughs> well, and let uh, us let us not forget what the great Dali quote: "I do not do drugs; I am drugs." <laughs> Think about it. Welcome to the Herbalist Hour. This is where community gather, merging the power of people and the flowers, the sweet and the bitter to the salty, the sour. Remind me, it's time for the Herbalist Hour. Welcome back to the Herbalist Hour. Today, I'm honored to have on Ash Ritter. Welcome to the show, Ash. Thank you, my friend. It's great to see you. And um, let's kick things off and learn a little bit, a little bit about your past. Uh, how did you get into this whole herbalism thing? <laughs> I mean, that's always a hard thing to answer. Um, totally. Let me sip some tea to properly. Yeah. <laughs> I'll join you. Yes. Um, I mean. First and foremost, I grew up in a tiny little beach community in Southern California. So I was always surrounded by these larger elemental forces than just sort of the human boxed in suburbia. And um, I remember as a child, just always eating oxalis, always eating mm. sourgrass. And I learned it from nobody. I, I literally just had this inclination and this instinct and this drive to chomp it. And I remember <laughs> I'd show my little sisters, I'm like, yeah, let's eat this plant, you know? And um, we loved the sourness and the juiciness and that almost fluorescent yellow flower. Um, so I feel like in many ways it started there. <laughs> yeah. Just allowing myself to eat weeds. <laughs> I love it. But also too, I mean, we would, you know, walk to the beach and find the huge bullwhip kelps and try and get each other with <laughs> kelp. And so how did I get into herbalism? I mean, it's always it's always been there. And um I consciously started studying it when I was around 16 years old. Wow. Um, yep. And the study started as a psychonaut. And I was interested primarily in rites of passage and initiation and how plants and fungi have been part of that all over the world um, in so many different ways and flavors and flares. So I dove deep pretty fast. I spent a lot of time at bookstores as my happy place um, when I was a teenager. So it started that way and ended up segueing into studying ethnobotany in college, so anthropology and botany. Um, and then from there, I said, no, no, academia. Um, I want to study directly from people who have a story and a lineage and honestly, by a mystical, not me efforting, um, the teachers came. So pretty much my study after departing from academia was one on one apprenticeships completely for many years. Yeah, yeah uh, <laughs> I have a story with Oxalis as well. Um, we we have a species that grows in the West Cascades in Oregon. And uh, I can't remember the species name for some reason right now, but uh, my mm -hmm. friend is like from inner city Baltimore and he came and visited me a few years ago and we went to the Brighton Bush hot. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It was the Cougar hot springs. And wow. uh, I showed him that you could eat some oxalis and he was just, he was already kind of stunned by the beauty of Oregon. And then uh, after eating oxalis, he was like, Oh my goodness, what is this? This is amazing. I think I turned him into a hippie right there on the spot. <laughs> uh, but um i kind of want to stick on the psychonaut theme um can okay. you explain what a psychonaut is <laughs> I will try. well my experience my interpretation is um this deep curiosity to explore the vastness of consciousness and that's not limited to human consciousness alone but this deep curiosity to dive into to swim amongst to explore with courage um, what may seem like great mysteries to some. Um, so oftentimes I think when people use that terminology, they're referring to certain compounds or certain plants or certain fungi that they choose to ingest. However, for me, it's just a state of a natural <laughs> state of being I'm like, I don't okay. know why I was born this way. Um, <laughs> just this deep curiosity for the unknown and, um, being willing to go out there and explore, uh, so that's a hard thing to answer, I suppose. Okay. So it's not just taking psychedelic mushrooms, in other words. 
No. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I don't know why I went there. I thought that's maybe what you were implying. <laughs> I might ask you about well, Amanita Mysteria later, that but too. okay. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am let... implying that too, but it's a deeper and grander answer than um, I love you know, that. Just chomp, chomp and stuff. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> very, very good. Well, um, yeah. Let's stick in your past for a little bit. Who have been some of your uh, herbal mentors? Oh my gosh. Um, well. You know, first, I want to thank Professor John Baker. So when I was in school, so I dropped out of high school early, but by happenstance, happened to find out about this program. It was called a middle college program where I could do a high school completion program for three days a week, and then I could go directly into community college and take whatever I wanted. And the first two classes I signed up for were History of Jazz, and um, anthropology of magic, witchcraft, and religion, <laughs> just because it sounded cool, you know? <laughs> it does. <laughs> and I get into the class. I've told this story before, but um, I get into the class and I'm sort of shy, tucked in the corner, reading mm. this book that I happen to find at a medical metaphysical bookstore called Hallucinogens and Shamanism. It has like an unmistakable bright orange kind of neonish cover. And the teacher walks up to me on the first day, a teacher walks up to me and he goes, what are you reading? And I was like, oh, no, <laughs> I'm about to get in really big trouble. He says, come talk to me after class. It turns out that um, he was a big part of the Society for the Anthropology of Consciousness and had a deep interest in entheogenic plants, um, specifically Datura. Um, and I don't know. So he was a first mentor, John Baker. He really took me under his wing and would like slip me books here and there, just gift me the books, invited me to these anthropology conferences and showed me that this wasn't just something that people were curious about in dead show parking lots. You know, this is something that we could study, at least at the time, study with, you know, respect and some sort of sense of credibility in a time where it seemed like anyone that was into that was wearing a tinfoil hat. Mm -hmm. Um However, you know, there's complexity with the credibility talk in academia. So John Baker, shout out Professor John Baker um, in Southern California. Um, huge shout out to Dr. Kenneth Profrock. He's um, a naturopath doctor. He's a wizard in disguise mm -hmm. <laughs> as a naturopath doctor. Um, well, he's got a giant wizard beard, so I don't know how much of a disguise it is. <laughs> <laughs> he has a fantastic beard. He does. Jelly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but again, I mean, one of my mentors, I had the privilege of, of shadowing him in his office in his clinical practice for two years. Um, and it blew my mind. I felt like a fish out of water, my friend, but he, again, just, he saw me at the good medicine con confluence years and years ago, um, many years ago. And it was actually his sweetheart, his partner, who was like, hey, I like the questions you asked in class. Like, come down and let me introduce you to Dr. P. And I was like, no, no, no. He's being crowded by a bunch of people. I don't want to impose. Yeah. I was, again, very shy. I don't want to impose. She <laughs> takes me down and she says, she says, Kenneth, this is Ash. She uh, wants to apprentice with you. When can she start? <laughs> That's awesome. He's like, nice to meet you, Ash. How about September? Um, so he... Uh, he has played a major, major role in um, in my life uh, for so many reasons, but really in his finesse with being able to be so multidisciplinary, um, so thoughtful, always have a sense of humor in the most challenging of contexts. He has some pretty heavy client cases. Um, yeah, an amazing person. I've had many amazing mentors, but those are two I think I'll shout out today. For sure. Yeah. Uh, when you were asking those questions in the audience of the Good Medicine Confluence, did you already have a, a quite a bit of like years of experience in herbalism or where were these questions coming from for you? Yeah. So um, I've always been so I've always been very I have my chunks, right? Like I have the academia chunk. I'm a big bookworm. I love scanning, you know, for data on PubMed and all these things. But I'm also um, a gnome, you know, a, a one that loves gnosis, one that loves experimenting and exploring and direct experience. So sort of both of those rivers came together in my life, you know, over time. 
And then also the river of of literally just happening to live in the city in San Francisco at the time and being the first at so many different accidents that I saw on the street and at a certain point being like, you know, maybe I should just learn some practical street herbalism mm -hmm. and or medic stuff. And, and um, so all of those kind of came in. So yeah, I have, I had a background and the questions I was asking, I thought were very dry and nerdy, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But well, the funny top secret that I finally revealed to him years later is um, I have a deep interest in the history of flying ointments, which are mm -hmm. like um, entheogenic, possibly psychoactive, yeah. um, you know, balms that are actually common all over the world, but are often associated with, like, quote unquote, the witches of Europe, um, yeah. European psychedelics, right? So I've always been interested in the topical application of psychoactive herbs. And um, at one point he was teaching a class about herbs for pain management. And I just said, have you ever made any shelf stable gels, you know, self shelf stable herbal gels? But I didn't admit I was asking about psychoactive lubes, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so that's like a funny story. But but yeah. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder if you picked up on that. <laughs> I told him this year, actually, oh, okay. <laughs> he had funny. no idea. <laughs> Just a quick break from the show to thank our presenting sponsor, Oshala Farm. Oshala Farm is a beautiful and vibrant certified organic herb farm based in Southern Oregon, where they grow and sell over 80 different plant species. The founders, Elise and Jeff Higley, have been longtime friends, so I highly trust their growing methods and ethics. You'll love the potency and vibrancy of all the herbs they have to offer. To learn more and purchase their herbs and other organic goods, head to oshalafarm.com. So thanks once again to Oshala Farm for sponsoring the Herbalist Hour. Now back to the show. Enjoy. So you've lived uh, in quite a few different locations, but I, I think of you as like a desert dweller. Can you kind of explain the ecosystem that you're currently in? Maybe some of the plants around you? Yes. Um, so I live in the Sonoran Desert. Um, so I'm in southern, south, kind of southeastern Arizona, and um, I've been here for seven years now, but I've always loved the desert. Um, my grandparents on my father's side, my nana and pop, uh, lived in the desert for quite some time in Southern California, and it always took me in and captured my heart. So the Sonoran Desert is a subtropical desert. Um I think that when most people conjure the image of the desert in their mind, it's very bleak and crispy critter and void of life. And that's completely not the case here. I, in my experience, and especially living in it, it's quite the opposite, especially right now. We have this little window of humidity during monsoon season, which is like, you know, July, August, creeping into September a wee bit. And the winds and the rains and the thunder and the humidity come up from Mexico. So all of the cacti right now are just like plump with yeah. water. So we have, I mean, the iconic cactus that has its own emoji is the saguaro cactus, Carnegia um, gigantea. Crazy story behind its Latin name, named after Andrew Carnegie. But Really? Um, yeah wow. <laughs> yeah never knew that <laughs> well it was changed the name was changed um because the story i was told is that certain botanists were trying to garner like um um uh philanth philanthropic philanthropic funds from carnegie so they changed the latin name of saguaro to carnegia wow um, and then one version of the story i was told was that they never got the donation but the name stuck you know <laughs> <So> <laughs> that's Cheap the bastard. thing about plant names eh yeah <laughs> but yeah so so we have um the iconic saguaro cacti out here we have lorea tridentata um some people know it as creosote or chaparral um that is the smell of desert rain when it rains the huge amount of volatile compounds in this plant just permeate the entire landscape and it's it's phenomenal um mm. it's a phenomenal curious beautiful plant um yeah i think it's something like 200 you know plus interesting chemical compounds over 60 volatile compounds it has almost like a resinous nature it's its own sunscreen that it's creating that's its survival strategy wow um, you know, so most plants out here have thorns, 
Um, but the, the chaparral is different in that it doesn't need thorns because it's taking up space with its smell and that resinous, you know, nature that it has protects it from the blazing sun. Um, a fantastic plant. Yeah. Is the saguaro, saguaro cactus uh, also psychedelic in nature? Uh, I feel like know, I've heard that before, but then I've also heard the opposite. It's an urban legend, and and there's nuance to this one. So if you look at the chemical constituents, there is a compound called, I believe it's called carnagine. Um, <laughs> yeah, Andrew right. Carnegie. So, yeah, there he is again. There he is <laughs> yeah. again. It's funny. And, it's one of these weird things where scientists injected it into mice, you know, mice brains, and they were high off of it. Now, where on planet Earth would anyone, anyone be injecting plant compounds into their brains? I don't know. <laughs> um, it also, you know, all cacti, all cactaceae have phenylethylamine, which we usually as associate with chocolate, you know, that's kind of this like, amphetamine like compound that makes you feel giddy it's the same thing we release when we have like butterflies when we're first meeting a cutie that we like really yeah <laughs> so all cacti have phenylethylamine in it and to a certain extent you know that's going to impact our mood however all of that to say interesting chemistry in saguaro cactus but the native people here, the autumn people, consider the saguaros their ancestors incarnate. Mm. And I don't feel that it would ever, ever, ever be appropriate to ingest the, the flesh of its body. Um, so that's my opinion. Um, that's my feeling. I don't, and, and there's no ethnobotanical data there's no history at least out loud of people eating it so because of that i feel like it's sort of um off limits in my in my book you know yeah uh my my teacher howie brownstein would call that a no pick right so yeah i like it thanks for clarifying that i've yeah i've never heard it put that way so th is there anything else you wanted to say about it or well there are the saguaro cactus fruits um, okay. That there is an there's an absolute history and reverence of the fruits, um, not just for humans, but for literally the entire ecosystem thrives off of what I perceive of and what I see as the world tree of the desert. Like life rallies around this cactus. So when it flowers, it's pollinated by bats and moths in the night. Um, super cool. It's this like huge, glorious white flower, you know, a sort of Datura esque in its like signature, in its shapage. Yeah. Um, and then when the fruits come, they are the bastion. They are kind of that signal and sign, like, hey, rain's gonna come soon. Everyone get ready. And and it's right at that peak of the hottest, driest time of year where all the creatures, humans, birds javelinas bobcats deer they're all like ah where's the food where's the water yeah. and so the fruit <laughs> um and it's this massive celebration um you know it's new year's in so many ways and um so that is a delicious fruit um and definitely has a context and a history for being eaten and well loved by all <laughs> I've never had it. I, I don't think oh. I've ever seen a flowering saguaro. Uh, I'd love to see one though. Oh my gosh. I'll have to send you a picture. Okay. Maybe I'll splice it onto the YouTube video if you don't mind. Please. Yeah. All right. Glorious. That'd be great. Okay. Uh, can, can you speak to Apuntia a little bit? Yeah. So Apuntia, um, sometimes people call it a uh, you know, prickly pear fruit comes from this cactus. Uh, sometimes people know it as nopal or nopales. Um, prickly pear cactus, uh, Apuntia. It's a species that's now found worldwide. Um, though it's been said that all cacti originate from the Americas, um, mm. probably South America, you know. So that's cool to think about, you know, because a lot of the plants here, I think we... A lot of the medicinal plants are, you know, in America, it's this melting pot. If, you know, it came from the Spaniards, it came from the Moors, it came from here, it came from there. But Cactaceae is American, you know, and I'm including South America in this. So Apuntia, prickly pear cactus, 
to me is like the ultimate apocalypse food. <laughs> I mean, it grows with minimal water, right? You can plant cuttings of it and it will thrive. That's one of its survival strategies is if it drops one of its pads, paddles, um, it will regrow, you know, as a whole new cactus right there. Um, the pads themselves are edible, although as they get older, they become more fibrous and it's not as fun. Um, <laughs> the pads themselves are edible. Um, so, yeah, a lot of people would know that as nopales. Um, an amazing mucilage. <laughs> yeah. Amazing slime factor. But it's interesting, too, because it's it's um, hydrophilic, right? So it it's it wants to draw water into its body. You know mm. what I mean? That's how cacti, it's so, that's why it's drawing for us. What I mean by that is if we were to eat nopal, to eat a puntia cactus, the paddles, um, there's that initial mucilaginous, nice slime coating the mucosa, but then that slime also wants to draw in water. So by doing that, it's drawing and kind of pulling things through the digestive tract and then helping you release them. Um, so kind of a nice wiggle waggle dance that it does as it moves through the GI tract. Um, and it has all this insoluble fi fiber. So like, like most slimy stuff does, you know, um, it slows the uptake of um, sugars into the bloodstream. Hmm. So an amazing blood sugar balancer or will drop blood sugar because of that. Um, so a fan fantastic for so many reasons. And that's just ingesting it. I mean, topically too, out here where I live, we have like all kinds of venomous critters. So um, topically, you know, using the fillet or like the inner pad sliminess of the nopal of the opuntia will draw out, um, you know, venoms from rattlesnakes or wow. scorpion stings or even just burn, you know, sunburn, um, it wants to draw out and draw out that heat, if you will. Um, totally. So would, yeah. would, an, would herbalists consider it both an astringent and a demulcent at the same time then? That's the interesting thing. I, I don't know if I'd go as far as astringent, but um, I'm sure there's a better technical term for it, but it does have that sort of like, oh, here's a technical term, maybe like adsorbs. Oh, okay. You know, kind of like similarly Absorbent. to what we'd think of, of like clays or activated totally. charcoal and stuff. Like, good it, comparison. Yeah. Sucks, sucks up the things that you don't want in there and then helps you poo them out. But, okay. it does so, but it does so in a sort of delicate, not too drying manner. So when you go like to the quote unquote Mexican section of a grocery department and you see the nopales, that's that's what we're talking about here. That's what we're talking about here. So yeah, you can get them all nice stuff with all the glaucids, the little hairs um, removed, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, usually it's the young pads, which are nice and tender. I think sometimes I've heard people compare them to kind of green bean yeah. texture, more or less. And then, of course, there are the fruits, which are popping off right now, the... Um, mm prickly pear fruit. Sometimes people call them tunas, um, tuna fruit, um, sabra. There's many, many names all over the world for the prickly pear fruit. But um, right now here, it's fluorescent fuchsia. Mm. It's gorgeous. I'm actually doing a culinary experiment the last few days, um, two experiments with prickly pear fruits. One amazing and one experiment not going so great. <laughs> Well, this is how we learn. Um, I haven't plugged your herbal business yet. It's called Black Sage Botanicals. Um, do you, so I do want to talk about your candy for sure, but okay. do, you, do you use a lot of these desert plants and the medicine you make and sell them? Yes. Um, so I, so I make an herbal candy. I have herbal candy of the month club. I think I'm That's in so cool. three or three or four years now. The story is that it started because I was teaching herbal cooking classes yeah. for quite some time at Tucson Herb Store. Shout out Tucson Herb Store. Um, it's a little apothecary we have downtown. And uh, nice. so I was teaching herbal cooking classes. And at a certain point, 
people were like, can we buy this? Can we buy it? I did a herbal ice cream sundae class and made like a peach leaf caramel and people flipped their lid. <laughs> people flipped wow. their lid. They're like, can we buy this? I said, I guess you could buy it. Sure. <laughs> you know, sure. and it just, it, long story short, it snowballed. So, so yeah, every month um, I create a completely different candy recipe and I always am trying to reflect what I'm seeing where I am um, and utilize, if not utilize some sort of beautiful fruit or leaf or flower or root that is growing on the land where I live um, to make it a poem about the time, about the season, you know, about the feelings that come with the season. So it's secretly like a conceptual art project, but, but it's also edible. So it's monthly. Does that mean someone could actually subscribe to it and just have it on auto pay? Is it more of like they pick and choose which ones they want as they go? Um, well, thanks. Thanks for plugging it. Um, of course. <laughs> that's nice. I'm, and I'm uh, dear listener, I'll leave, a, I'll leave a link to that in the show notes as well. So you could just click on it and get, go right to the page. But sorry, I interrupted you. No, that's I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm feeling like um, what's the word? I'm blushing a little bit. Um, <laughs> Because I'm not good All at good. Market. I'm not good at marketing. You know what I mean. <laughs> herbalist I, downfall. Um, yeah. <laughs> I am good at math, though. I am one of those herbalists that's good at math. <laughs> um, that's really so, cool. Howie so, Brownstein's a great mathematician too. Hey. Yeah. Shout out to your <laughs> herbalist mathematicians. There are some of us that do like math. Um, so yes, I have two options for the Herbal Candy Club. I have a Patreon page. Okay. Uh, which actually has candy plus a ton of other stuff. I do monthly live streams. I do a lot of writing. I drop a bunch of free classes and videos about plants on there, all kinds of stuff. Um, but that's where people can sign up and have a long-term subscription for Candy Club. That's cool. But I also do sort of a small amount of a la carte um, on my website. So every month I'll just have a flavor drop and I'll say, okay, you're only, this month I only have 10 extras or 15 extras max, you know, and I'll put them on the website until they're gone. So those are the two paths one could take towards candy. And then if you don't sell the rest, then you just get to eat them all. <laughs> I have been selling. I've been selling out for a couple years in a row. <laughs> that's awesome. Congrats. I've never heard of such a product before. I think that's so unique and cool. Oh, yeah, it's. Well, you know, it really, um, it was really in, yeah, the end of 2019, 2020, where the world was changing rapidly, very rapidly. And yeah. um, it started as this passion project, besides people asking for it from the cooking classes, it started as this passion project of, can we still have a little bit of sweetness in our lives? Can I just mail people something that'll keep them happy? through challenging um, time, you know, whatever people were perceiving and experiencing, you know, in 2020 is like, how can I bring a little bit of joy, a little bit of lightheartedness, maybe yeah. even some sweetness, literal and metaphorical and um, it's medicinal so too. And, and secretly medicinal. And that's yeah. the thing, right? And I learned this from my grandma is if you can make something delicious, people will, will go for it, you know, and, not everyone likes the crazy tasting tinctures. Not everyone <laughs> wants to drink these um, really intense, you know, bitter teas. But if I can put, you know, sneak with with consent, sneak a bunch of <laughs> herbs or, or medicinal mushrooms in a candy and it's delicious. And then I make, oh, I should have, I should have one out, but um, I make hand-drawn zines with the candy every month. So it's a little pamphlet that comes that says like, by the way, um, Tremides versicolor turkey tail is also really, really fantastic uh, antiviral. And did you know it's a saprophytic fungi? That means it breaks down logs and builds soil. How cool is that? You know, so I, as it, as it tastes good, people are re more receptive to learning. I'd like to think to learning about what's actually going on here. Wait, what am I eating? Wait, I could, I could do this all the time and it would benefit me and my family. Like, Oh, oh. so I s snuck it right in, you know, getting people excited about plants and stuff. Yeah. What a unique offering. And then, yeah, to throw in the zine as well. Uh, are, are your, 
customers that are buying the candy are these like super hardcore herb nerds or are they kind of just like your standard like health conscious type person as well it's totally both that's cool it's both and it's really fun to see who comes in and from where and why um so i think the herb nerds appreciate it off you know right out the gate um but there are other people and they're like, my friend gave me one of these or my daughter gave me one of these and I tried it. And I think it would be great for my husband who needs this, but is refuses to drink tea. And oh. so, yeah, it comes from a lot of different sort of ponds, if you will. And it's it's really fun for me to witness. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure candy increases compliance big time. Yeah. Uh, right on. <laughs> well, dear listener, I will include links to um, all of black sage botanicals offerings um right. along with yeah the candy and whatnot so i do want to transition a little bit ash um, uh, so i've got a mystery question so i have two guest questions one's a mystery question and i was told that you should try to guess uh who it was that asked it so let's see how oh. this goes <laughs> okay. oh my gosh oh my gosh <laughs> okay so here we go here's the here's the fir- there by the way it's from the same person Okay. Um, so the mystery question is, or if you could see, you could guess who it was that asked it. Uh, does Ash believe that cocaine should be reintroduced into Coca-Cola? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my Lord. Do you know who asked that out of curiosity? <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, do, I'll tell you. Jesus so. Christ. <laughs> okay. Do I believe... Um, no, because that is like a super strong extract um, um, that I feel is uh, not an authentic representation of the beautiful coca leaf. Now, do I think yes. coca leaf uh, would be appropriate in a soda? Heck yes, I do. Um, I mean, I've heard it said that coca leaf is as mineral dense as like nettles. Wow. Um, and when I was in Peru, I did try coca leaf tea, um, many years ago, and I found it to be less stimulating than yerba mate. Wow. Uh, And I'm very sensitive to that. Like, I'm not, uh, I'm not into that, that side of the fence, you know, the stimulating stuff. I like the relaxing stuff. So, but, uh, um, uh, yeah, I found coca leaf tea to be far less stimulating than than mate as an example. Um, so yeah, I'd say a coca leaf in soda, sure. But I wouldn't go further than that. <laughs> Whoever asked that silly person, oh my god. I uh I I wonder if that's what he meant, if he meant to say coca leaf, but he he Maybe. it says cocaine. Okay. Uh this this episode is all about drugs. So Woo! Uh, <laughs> well and let uh, us let us not forget what the great um, Dali quote, which is Salvador. Yeah. Okay. He said, I something, or maybe this is a fake quote, but um, I do not do drugs. I am drugs. <laughs> Think about it. I love that. I, I am. Right. Oh my God. Dopamine, serotonin. Like, oh my God. You know, yeah. there's uh, all sorts of, yeah, chemical re- reactions happening inside of us all, all the time. So, all the time. Uh, so that was a uh, Charles Doc Garcia. Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> Chuck. Okay. Also, one of my dear mentors. <laughs> Freaking Chuck! I should have yeah. known. I should have yeah. known. Um, um, shout out Chuck, California School of Hispanic Herbalism. I yeah, I read in your bio that he was one of your teachers, and so I reached out to ask if he wanted to do any guest questions. Um, oh so he sent God. me he sent me that first one, which was more of a joke, and then uh, the second question is uh, more on a serious note. Uh, okay. So this is also from Charles Dar- Doc Garcia. Um, Has Ash treated clients with mushrooms for depression or depressive anxiety? Ah, uh, <laughs> well. Um... I technically can't treat anything because I'm an herbalist, right? <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Which is almost why I went to medical school. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I was interested in crossing that line. And that was part of my study with um, Dr. Profrock was, do I want to go to medical school right now? I decided against that. So 
So technically, according to the FDA, I cannot treat, cure, or fix anything. But I can tell you really interesting anecdotal things. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. So have I treated? No. Um, and let me be clear that there are an immense amount of fungi, mushrooms, um, many, many kinds of mushrooms, not just fruiting bodies, you know, that we think of the classic yeah. little guy, little stem and cap guy. Um, but there's fungi literally in the bodies of many medicinal plants that we eat, that we ingest. Um, we call those endophytes, right? There's fungi in the soil that grows our plants. There's fungi in our gut and on our skin. Um, so in that sense, um, yes, mushrooms are profound. And I'm talking about all of them. Now, I know which one Chuck is referring to. He's probably referring to the psilocybe species. <laughs> um, and what I can say is that <laughs> I'm being very careful about this. Um, I can't dispense any of that because of the strange gray zone that we're in as far as legality is concerned. But I do love sharing um, the ethnomycology, so the historical context and usage of not just psilocybe mushrooms, but the Amanita muscaria mushroom another important entheogenic mushroom. Um, and I share and teach a lot about the history and cultural context all over the world. Um, and hopefully when I share that um, data, that people can come to their own conclusions about how those beings, how that technology can work for them, and then they get to decide um, how they wanna implement that in their lives or not. Um, so that's my very careful answer. Yeah, thank you. And I appreciate you being conservative and responding. And this is a good <laughs> moment to tell the to tell the listener that this is this is a show that doesn't give out medical advice ever in any sort of way, whether that's mental health um, or just yeah, standard medical advice. So uh, do your own research and be safe. Um, but yeah, thanks, Ash. Yeah, I mean, and that's one of the reasons, honestly, why. I, I actually love studying history. And um, as an ethnobotanist, you know, we didn't have the term ethnomycology in my day. Um, <laughs> but as an ethnobotanist, so someone that studies history through the lens of plants and mushrooms, um, I find that to be just as important, if not, in my opinion, more important, perhaps, if I can say so, um, right. than a lot of the clinical data that comes out now. Um, Sometimes the clinical data that we see about something like psilocybe mushrooms, there's a history for that that goes back hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, and people can say, well, yeah, duh, you know, we, we knew, you know. Um, so I don't I'm not poo pooing, you know, any side, any sides. It's just a matter of um, to me, it's like if you, you know, and like Bob Marley says, if you know your history, you know where you're coming from. And mm. so. Um, I, I quite like sharing history and that's also a way for me to share about my love and, um, the power and the potency of these plants and mushrooms and doing it in a way that, um, the bureaucratic system that we live in can accept. <laughs> Well, with the uh, ever-expanding le legalization of marijuana cannabis, mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping to see something similar for uh, psilocybin. Uh, you know, I think it may be just a matter of time. Hopefully, maybe that's overly optimistic, but I know psilocybin personally has helped uh, me, if I'm allowed to say that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll say I'll be I'll I'll stand with you. It's helped me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it helps me. All, it helps me all the time, and yeah. I wouldn't be who I am. I would not be who I am without it for so many reasons. I could say exactly the same thing. Um, yeah. Well, thanks for sharing your experience. Um, why don't we try a new segment, a newish segment I've been trying. It's called Explain That Graham. And I stole it directly from a, a talk show on YouTube called Hot Ones, okay. uh, where, the, where the host has the uh, guests eat progressively hotter and hotter chicken wings. But we're not going to do that part. Basically, okay. what I'm, gonna do, I'm just going to show you... Um, something from your Instagram, a picture from your Instagram, and then you could tell uh, us like the broader story. Okay. So, so um, 
And uh, yeah, dear listener, if you're just listening to the audio, you can see the picture on uh, YouTube, or I'll just leave a link to the picture in the show notes. And follow Ash on Instagram while you're at it. Oh, thanks. So, yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna try this share screen thing here. Okay. Can you see it? Yes. So you actually already talked about this couple already. So I'm just kind of curious if you want to take us back to that moment in time and just uh, share a little story about it. Yes. So, okay. This year, um, I had the privilege of speaking at the Good Medicine Confluence. It's actually the first herbal conference I ever went to. Where are we in time? Over a decade ago, I suppose, at this point, or yeah, over a decade ago. And actually, Chuck, Charles Garcia took me there as his sidekick. So the backstory I'll tell really fast is Chuck took me as his sidekick to Good Medicine Confluence over a decade ago. This year was a full circle moment where I got to teach there. So this picture is Dr. Kenneth Profrock and his sweetheart, Darla. And um, what's really funny about this year is Dr. P and I didn't talk about what we were sharing. And as soon as the schedule came out, we saw that we were both talking about solanaceae plants and tropane alkaloids. We like see, I mean, our talks, of course, diverged into really different spirals, but we, it was really, really funny. So this is a, a really happy moment for me in, in just feeling this, um, you know, coming out of my shell slowly, but surely and being able to speak on stage no stage but you know speak on stage with somebody who i really love and admire um and just as much as i love and admire dr profrock i also love and admire darla she is mm. an incredible beautiful uh ball of light human being so that's that picture <laughs> awesome thanks for sharing yeah and uh yeah. the good medicine confluence just looked like an amazing event i've been a couple times but unfortunately had to miss this year so uh those full circle moments are just the best so uh good job ash that's that's so neat thanks that you yeah. know that's where i first met you my friend also that that makes sense yeah i wonder which one it was uh yeah i know yes. i went to the one outside of new mexico or outside of albuquerque but was it the cloudcroft one yeah it was the cloudcroft one yep that's right yeah, yeah. taking me back all right Whoa. so here's the other oh. one <laughs> have you hugged a cactus lately so yeah i had to share this one i'm like that's that's intense but yeah let's hear it well and you know what's funny is this is a young cactus this is a young saguaro comparatively so see it doesn't even have any of its side arms yet um so just a wee youngster i mean maybe what 50 60 years old compared mm -hmm. to some of these 200 year old almost elephant looking fellows out here on the ranch where i live but um I think, uh, yeah, I also utilize this photo as a pun about talking about phallic, phallic things and the bombs <laughs> and broomstick class. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, this is a this is a young saguaro cactus um, out here. This is just basically my backyard. I, I live on a big old wow. ranch. So, um, yeah, I, what what more? I could say so many things. No, that's great. <laughs> yeah, I'm just. Uh, so for the listener, Ash is hugging a pretty pretty large saguaro cactus, but I'll leave a link to that one as well in the show notes. All right, and let's they stop. Do, they oh, do yeah. have thorns. They do have thorns, but if you were to zoom in, you'd see that I'm hugging not not a huge bear hug. Okay. <laughs> Badass. <laughs> awesome. Well, um, pre-show we were talking about maybe potential uh talking topics and you said you might want to chat a bit about the nightshade family would you like to chat about the nightshade family sure um so the nightshade family solanaceae super duper fascinating to me and of course i have this deep curiosity um for the sort of misunderstood plants and misunderstood mushrooms, misunderstood families, and Solanaceae nightshades are definitely one of them. Um, to where, you know, certain people in nutrition circles are like, "Oh, I can't eat nightshades; they're inflammatory," right? And then other people, they're like, "This is my ancestral food." You know, I, I eat chile and tomato, and I eat eggplants all the time, every day, right? Um, 
um, out here, actually, you know, this is, you know, if we look at some of these nightshade um, family plants, they're some of the best growers in the desert, like chilte pin pepper, the OG original pepper, um, as an example. So nightshades are fascinating. I like their paradoxical nature, because even in the name, right, you have nightshades, and then solanaceae, S-O-L, sun. Mm. <laughs> I never thought about that. Oh my God. Yeah. All throughout, all throughout, from plant to plant to plant to plant, there is this constant sort of like paradox duality dance happening in the mythology and the stories. Um, super fascinating. So I, I love these edges. I love writing these edges. Um, and that was what drew me into wanting to understand, you know, this deeper question of what is toxin? what is tonic what is poison what is medicine who gets to decide that and why yeah. um and and again over the past few years you know that's when i started coming out with my nightshade plant research over the past few years is to start a bigger conversation of you know by what authority do we decide is you know something is named poison or or medicine and um what are we going to do about that? You know, how can we think bigger about that? And uh, so, yeah, Solanaceae nightshade plants, um, so many of them have deep, long-standing traditions, um, not just as entheogenic or psychoactive plants, but um, also for very, very practical reasons, um, including culinary use and um, including pain, pain management, actually, which is, you know, if we think about Ah, uh, I forget the statistic, but it's something like in the United States, we use, you know, a, a vast majority of the world's opiates. And it's like, well, do we have a vast majority of the world's pain? Hmm. You know, so so thinking about plants and mushrooms for pain management is also just a really interesting practical aside. Um, so, yeah, we, we could go a million places <laughs> with the nightshade, fam. Is Datura in the nightshade? It I'm sure is. Correctly? Okay. Yeah. And that's more on like the, say the psychoactive side of things. It is. However, um, it's an absolutely profound, um, you know, respiratory herb as well. In fact, a lot of the nightshade plant plants, so including tobacco, right? Tobacco is a nightshade mm. plant. Um, so, you know, in very small amounts has a profound effect on supporting the respiratory system especially for people with asthmatic conditions um but you know you take a little bit too much um you know burning it as a smoke for example inhaling it as a smoke and it's going to change your state of consciousness but are you talking about datura or uh, tobacco both both okay but yeah datura datura okay. um datura is a fascinating plant so so i actually grew up in Ventura County, California, and we have a pictograph paint, you know, a cave painting um, a bit north of where I grew up, but in the same county that's called, I believe it's called like Pinwheel Cave or, you know, we named it that, we non-native people named it that, but uh, it's a painting of a Datura flower. And mm -hmm. Datura is a very, very, very important sacred plant for the Chumash people, which are the native people where I grew up. Um, so yeah, a lot to do, you know, in the sacred context with uh, rites of passage, visioning, um, gathering data from the beyond and bringing it to the community. Um, interesting too, to think about certain balms were made, I believe it was like the Yaki people. So that's like, you know, just like the Northwest tip of Mexico. Um, um making balms flying ointment you know to rub on the belly for visioning um things like this but also for pain management um detura is fascinating well if we could stick on just for a couple minutes i don't know if you have any spiels about tobacco in general um i i smoke an occasional cigar here and there and um i never really smoked before until like say this past year or two uh yes. and so i just I don't really know much about the plant other than I enjoy smoking the occasional cigar. So do you have any uh, spiels about that tobacco? Sure. I love tobacco. Um, I don't smoke it, 
uh, at this point in my life, but I adore it as a as a being. Um, and I, I find it so curious. Again, something that's been so absolutely vilified and yet yeah. is considered highly important and highly sacred for so many First Nations peoples. Um, yeah. You know, Henbane similarly worked with in Europe, you know, which is a relative um, smoked in similar ways that you see First Nations people in the States working with tobacco. Um, topically, you know, topically, it's an it's a really, really, really amazing liniment, again, for pain yeah. management. Um, and, uh, you know, Chuck, so calling in Chuck, Charles Garcia, he always said, um, one of the most important things to carry in your go bag, your like emergency apocalypse bag is a pack of tobacco. Mm -hmm. Um, he said, cause you can use it topically for pain, you know, make a poultice with it, but also there are going to be people that are really wanting their fix. And if you have some tobacco, that's going to be a real good barter item right there. <laughs> good point. <laughs> but no, chemi chemically speaking, I mean, you know, there are many things we could talk about of its its sacred and ceremonial nature. But chemically speaking, really, really fascinating. The whole um, we have receptor sites in our in our body called nicotinic receptor sites, you know, arguably we're, we were built for this. We've co-evolved. <laughs> we're called, yeah. we also have muscarinic receptor sites, right? Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about muscimol or muscarine from Amanita muscaria, so people always, I think, refer to their cannab, you know, cannabinoid in endogenous cannabinoids and da da da. But I'm like, we got more. <laughs> yeah, we got a lot. <laughs> we got a lot, a lot more than that. So, point. so yeah. the thing about nicotine and the nicotinic receptor sites is its relationship with, um, choline or the you know the acetylcholine system it's like that ability to that ability to focus mm. helping us bring in honing in on a task and handling a task at hand um, that has a lot to do with how we run acetylcholine through our brains um, and through our body so nicotine is really really exceptional at that guess what so is caffeine mm-hmm and that's like the famous pair, right? Like I can't yep. start my day without my coffee and cigarette. Well, right. interesting to think that those are chemical compounds in there that help us focus really well. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, you know, I, I intend to teach a class about all, I've been writing a class about all this actually. Um, but I, I'm fascinated by tobacco for so many reasons. Um, yeah. Well, when you do, you should reach out and let me know if it's, especially if it's online, I would love to attend if I can. Oh, heck yeah. 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 I'd love to That'd have you great. in space. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Sweet. Well, I feel like you taught a lot about plants today, uh, <laughs> giving the audience what they want. I love it. Well, why don't we end the show with uh, just getting to know Ash a little bit better? I'm going to just ask you some kind of fun, random questions. So Ash, okay. besides herbalism, what is one of your random hobbies? Oh my God. Um, I love music. I love me. I'm music is my sanctuary. It's my life. Um, I grew up in a very musical household. Uh, I have a big record collection. Uh, I play a bunch of instruments, not very well. I secretly sing and love to sing, but I usually don't share that out loud with people. <laughs> um, yeah, music is my is my everything. It keeps me going. <laughs> yeah, pre-call, I was talking to you about my interview with Torin Frost, the rapper who did the uh, Herbalist Hour uh, intro song, and uh, he said a very similar thing. He said music is his medicine, and uh, yeah. yeah, I love that. I love I loved your perspective and his perspective on that. It kind of made me think of it in a new way. Um, oh. All right, well, let's do a, a rapid fire round. You could give a, as long or as short as answers as you like. Um, okay. So, speaking of music, who is one of your favorite singers or bands of all time? <laughs> Oh God, Stevie Wonder, mm. um, Stevie Wonder, Fela Kuti, Erica Badu, Von Benjamin from Midnight. Uh, yeah, those are the tops right off you, the bat. You love music because I said who was one, and you gave me like four. Oh so. God, I know. <laughs> there's no way I could say it's one. hard to choose <laughs> exactly. Like, well, Stevie Wonder, but but ah, there's too that's many. so neat. I love it. <laughs> uh, are you an introvert or an extrovert? Oh God, I'm, I'm an introvert out in, in groups and extrovert one-on-one. -on -one. Oh yeah. I'd say I, I'm, I'm definitely very similar in that regard. Uh, uh, if I were to say, what's your spirit animal, what would you say? 
Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. I think that honestly, my human body is the spirit animal because I know I'm I'm like more than the human body. I mean, there are animals that I deal with too, but I don't want to talk about that. But no, I think Respect. it's like this is this is my freaking animal, you know, and I'm finally learning that. Like I feel like herbs have taught me how to be a human in a body. So I'm going to say this thing right here. That is such a good answer. It's such <laughs> an answer from a um, an experienced psychonaut too. So oh God, I, lo yeah. I love that. <laughs> um, do you have a favorite movie genre? I don't watch a lot of movies. I don't. Oh God. I actually don't know a lot of, I could talk about <laughs> music all day, but I don't know a lot of movies. Do I have a favorite genre? Uh, I don't know. I like Star Trek though. <laughs> <laughs> That counts. <laughs> You're a Trekkie. A little uh, bit. Do you, only a few more. Do you have uh, any nicknames? I guess uh, Ash is kind of a nickname. I I guess I have a few. Um, uh, God, do I want to say any of them out loud? <laughs> there was a, there was a point um, yeah. where when I was feeling kind of like many many years ago, and I was not super happy that I started going by the name Otter just because mm. when I think of otters, they make me really happy. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, not really. Not really. Uh, yeah. My sisters and I make up funny names for each other, but it's usually a different one every day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Speaking of spirit animals, I was told mine, mine one time was, I was told that Otter was my spirit animal. So yeah, well, they're, 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 yeah, lovely beings uh yeah, all right are. last one is there a plant that you're currently enamored with oh lord of mercy this is always the hardest thing to ask a plant lover yeah okay is currently enamored with well i see i'm overthinking it um i'm overthinking it <laughs> um currently in ah no see i thought of 20 at once let's see what do i have on my table right here well I love OSHA root with all of my heart, but it's also something that I feel really sensitive about. Like, I don't want to overuse it. So no. um, one drop, one drop here and there to taste it. Totally. All right. We'll go with OSHA root. We'll go with OSHA. Yeah. And you, dear listeners, well, you please use responsibly. So please. Um, yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I think that's pretty much it. Did you uh, have any closing thoughts before we get out of here, Ash? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I'm really thankful for this opportunity to share and be seen. I chatted up with you. Closing fun. thoughts. Uh, it's a weird world and it's a weird time. So just be as be weird. Amen. Just go for it. Just go for it, everybody. Why Embrace not? your weirdness. At this, at this point, just go for it. Do your thing. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> well, it was really nice to get to know you a little bit more and, you know. Uh, learn about your 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 product line, your candies, and and all about the plants growing around you. Uh, I want to say off memory, your website's blacksagebotanicals.bigcartel.com. Yeah, uh, and and blacksagebotanicals.org should be a good shortcut too. Oh, okay. It'll just take you right there. Okay, it, good, it, good. It, it better. That's how it's programmed to go. <laughs> well, dear listener, if you enjoyed the show, please check out Ash's Instagram, her store, and maybe even purchase some candy from her. It sounds like it sells out all the time. So um, I love it. It was it was great to get to know you more, Ash. Let's have you on for a round two because I still got even more questions for you. So um, someday in the future, we'll we'll jump back on, a, on an episode. And, um, and yeah, thanks to you all for listening. And we'll see you in the next episode of the Herbalist Hour. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching today's episode of the Herbalist Hour. If you enjoyed it, please give it a thumbs up. And if you want more great herbal content, be sure to subscribe to our Herb Rally YouTube channel. Uh, if you enjoy these Herbalist Hour episodes and you'd like to join us live, uh, you can do so by becoming an Herb Rally Schoolhouse member. Uh, learn more at herbrally.com slash schoolhouse. And if you want to get your first 30 days for free, use coupon code YouTube30 at checkout. So our Herb Rally Schoolhouse members get access to exclusive video classes, monographs, and a lot more more herbal community discounts um, along with joining these live 
Herbalist Hour interviews. So one more time, herbrally.com slash schoolhouse. Enter coupon code YouTube30 at checkout to get your first 30 days for free. All right, we'll see you in the next episode and take care.